Hi, everybody, and welcome to the presentation, Hot Chocolate from Indigenous American Rituals to Victorian Children's Breakfasts. My name is Krista, and I am one of the programming librarians here at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. And please join me in welcoming Sarah Wasberg Johnson, AKA the food historian, who will be doing our presentation this evening. Uh, Sarah has recently been featured on the History Channel series, The Food That Built America. And I believe the next season is starting pretty soon and she should be on that as well. So just a few housekeeping things. Um, you are all muted at the moment and please stay muted and keep your mics and videos off through the presentation. Um, there will be a lot of time at the end. If you do have any questions, you can unmute yourself at that point and Sarah will be more than happy to answer. But during the presentation, feel free to utilize our chat, um, ask any questions, make comments or suggestions as both Sarah and myself will be monitoring that throughout the presentation. Um, our presentation will also be recorded. So if you do miss something or if you wanna go back and try some of the recipes that Sarah's are gonna talk about or just rewatch again, um, it will be available on our YouTube channel probably within a week or so. And I'm also going to share the link with everybody who did register. So you'll get to watch it at some point pretty soon. Other than that, I think that's it for me. So I'm gonna pass along to Sarah and I'll see everybody at the end of the presentation. Bye-bye. Thanks, Krista. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to start with a um, video that I pre-recorded of me making both hot chocolate and hot cocoa. Uh, and then I'll pause if anybody has any questions about the um, recipes or the cooking technique. And then we will switch over and I will talk about the history part. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah Wasberg Johnson and welcome to the Food Historian Kitchen. Today is a gray, cold, miserable day out and uh, to counteract that a little bit, we are going to be making hot chocolate from scratch. Now, in the United States, hot chocolate and hot cocoa are terms that are used kind of interchangeably, but they're really two very different things. Hot chocolate is literally made from chocolate, and hot cocoa is made from cocoa powder. So today we're gonna to be making both versions. We're gonna start with the hot chocolate, um, and in order to do that, we need to have a water bath on our stove. If you don't have a double boiler like me, you can make one with a pot of simmering water and a glass bowl, which is what we're gonna to do today. We're going to start today with this little cookbook from Baker's Chocolate. This cookbook is from 1936. Um, Baker's Chocolate is a very old company dating back to the 18th century. Uh, and as some of you may or may not know, for about the first 2,000 years of chocolate consumption uh, in the world, chocolate was drunk. It was not eaten. The development of chocolate confection doesn't really come until the 19th century. Um, so even in the United States, the first chocolate consumption in our new nation was chocolate that was drunk, usually for breakfast or in the afternoon. It was very similar to how Europeans consumed coffee and tea. Uh, and it uses unsweetened chocolate, so it's 100% um, cacao, right? And the reason why it uses unsweetened chocolate is because uh, historically, chocolate was not pre-sweetened. You added cream and sugar to it, uh, much like you would with coffee or tea. So this recipe calls for two squares, Baker's unsweetened chocolate, one cup of water, which I have pre-measured, three tablespoons of sugar, I have some sugar right here, a dash of salt and three cups of milk. So it says add chocolate to water in the top of a double boiler. And again, we don't have one. So we just have a pot of steaming water in a glass bowl. Uh, place over low flame, stirring until chocolate is melted and blended. Add sugar and salt and boil four minutes, stirring constantly. Place over boiling water. 
add milk gradually, stirring constantly, then heat. Just before serving, beat with a rotary egg beater until light and frothy. And it says it serves six because, of course, uh, in the period, um, the servings were much smaller. So it's really only um, slightly more than a half cup serving. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first things first, our recipe calls for four squares of baker's chocolate. Now, historically, one square of baking chocolate was a full ounce of chocolate. Um, today, a lot of baking chocolate is divided into quarter ounce rectangles. So we're going to need eight rectangles uh, of baking chocolate to add to our double boiler. Okay, so eight rectangles is half a bar of baking chocolate. I've broken it up into little rectangles so that it melts a little quicker. So we're going to add this to our makeshift double boiler with some water and see how it melts. Oh yeah, it's already, once it comes in contact with the hot glass, it's already starting to melt. So I'm going to let this Get in here, I'm going to add this water. It's going to take the water a little bit to come up to temperature, I think. So we're just going to stir it all together. And let that fully melt. Okay, so it looks like our chocolate is pretty much all melted into the water here. So we're going to do the next steps of the recipe, which is to add three tablespoons of sugar and a dash of salt. Now remember, our, this cocoa, um, this chocolate is unsweetened, so we are adding our sweetener to make sure that our hot chocolate tastes good. <laughs> and then just a dash of salt. That's actually kind of a lot. Really just a pinch is plenty. Alright, so the next step in the recipe is not super clear. It says to take the sugar and chocolate and salt mixture and boil it, stirring constantly for four minutes. But then it says to place over boiling water. So I'm going to assume that this is the traditional double boiler that's like two pans on top of each other. And you're going to put one, the top pan directly on the stove and then move it over boiling water. So what I've done is I've transferred um, our mixture into another little pot, currently bringing it to a boil. I am going to boil it for four minutes, stirring constantly, and then I'm going to put it back into our double boiler when it comes time to add the milk. Okay, well that was fun. Um, the purpose of boiling the chocolate mixture is really, I think, to reduce the amount of water and also to turn it into a little bit of a syrup. So we boiled our mixture for four minutes, stirring constantly. You really do have to stir it the whole time. Uh, I recommend a little bit longer handled spoon than I used because um, there is quite a lot of steam. Um, and you have to keep stirring it for two reasons. One is you don't want it to boil over, which it very much can. Uh, and two is you don't want the chocolate mixture to burn, right, because you're cooking it over quite high heat. So I have my mixture. I've got my boiling water going again in my double boiler. So we're going to add the mixture to the double boiler, and it has thickened quite a bit. It's looking very chocolatey and delicious. Whole milk because if you're gonna make hot chocolate 
with this much effort. Why use anything else? Um, also, 100% cocoa uh, chocolate does not have a lot of fat in it. So, to get that yummy, creamy taste, we want to have some fat in our whole milk. You could probably even use um, half and half or a light cream if you wanted something really rich. So the recipe says to add the milk gradually, stirring constantly over boiling water. So that's what we're going to do. already looking very good. So remember we're adding three cups of milk, so this is cup number two. You'll need to make sure that your um, bowl or a double boiler is big enough to accommodate four cups of liquid. Okay, so the last part of the recipe says, once it's heated, to whip it with a rotary egg beater, which again, I don't have, but I have this nice balloon whisk and some mussels, so we're going to do it that way. Give it a taste. Hmm. That's good. It is a little frothy because I whipped it up with uh, the balloon whisk. It is very rich in chocolate taste because we use that unsweetened cocoa. And it's not particularly sweet. So I could see if you were going to serve this um, in the period you might want to put... Um, a little cream and sugar on the table if people wanted theirs richer or a little bit sweeter. But it makes a pretty tasty treat on a chilly day. Our next recipe is a little more straightforward. Uh, it comes from a little Hershey's cookbook lit published in 1937, and it's actually a recipe for an individual serving of hot cocoa. So, cocoa in the 19th century, there were two options. You had natural processed cocoa, which is kind of a reddish color and a little more acidic. And then you had Dutch processed cocoa, which um, has an alkaline mixture added to it to remove some of the acidity. So, if you know anything about the history of red velvet cake, which is actually a chocolate cake, Red velvet cake was originally made with um, natural processed cocoa uh, and then the addition of buttermilk would kind of react with the acid in the cocoa uh, and the baking soda 
and produce kind of a reddish hue to the cake. We didn't add food coloring until later. So we're going to be using Dutch processed cocoa today to make our hot cocoa recipe. So again, this is for one individual serving from this 1937 Hershey's recipe. And it says, hot cocoa individual service. For each cup, use one heaping teaspoonful Hershey's cocoa and one teaspoonful sugar. Mix dry and add four tablespoons hot water to make a paste. Heat to boiling point and add one cupful of milk, and again bring to boiling point, but do not boil. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So because this recipe calls for hot water, I actually have a little bit of hot water heating on the stove right now. But what we need to do is add one heaping teaspoon of cocoa and one heaping teaspoon of sugar. And actually, so I don't have to wash my teaspoon. <laughs> or get cocoa in my sugar, I'm going to start with the sugar. So I'm going to say that that's a heaping teaspoon. Oh, my water is boiling, so I'm going to turn it down a little. And then cocoa is a little bit lighter, so I'm going to say that's a heaping teaspoon of cocoa. Might be slightly more cocoa than sugar. We're going to mix them together. And then add our four tablespoons of hot water to make a paste. So again, this has a little bit more familiar cocoa taste to it, right? You can taste the cocoa powder. It tastes a lot more like the hot cocoa that a lot of us grew up with. And again, 
like the other one, it's not very sweet. It's less rich because it doesn't have that whole chocolate in it, um, just the cocoa powder, so it um, doesn't have as much fat content, doesn't have as much body to the liquid. It's a little bit thinner tasting, I think in part because we made um, that sort of little syrup with the sugar and the cocoa and the water, but it still tastes very good. All right, so that's our two historic hot chocolate and hot cocoa recipes. Uh, I hope you guys try this at home and see which one you like better. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Looks like there's a bunch of questions in the chat. Okay, let's see what everybody says. Oh, Karen, thank you that, for reminding everybody that the, the History Channel started on Sunday. I totally missed that, so I'll have to go catch up. And uh, yes, it is. It's pretty involved, both of these uh, cocoa recipes. Um, yay, Tammy, for hot cocoaing along. <laughs> and Chris is too. Um, okay. Anna Cecilia asks, why do they spe specify not to boil? I boil it. Have I been ruining my chocolate? So I think it's once you add the milk, you're not supposed to bring it to a boil uh, because the acid in the chocolate might curdle the milk. Um, that doesn't usually happen today because our milk is homogenized. Um, but I can see why that's probably why they say not to boil it. Um, okay. All right, any other questions about the recipes before we move on to the uh, the talk, history talk portion? No? All right, feel free to keep chatting along as we go. Um, I'm probably not gonna keep track of the chat while I'm doing the talk, just to make everybody aware, but we'll have plenty of time um, at the end for questions and comments and all kinds of other fun stuff. So, away we go. All right, so tonight's talk, hot chocolate from indigenous American rituals to Victorian children's breakfast. We're actually gonna be going a little bit further than that in the talk all the way up um, almost to the present. So we'll probably have some familiar uh, sites uh, in the PowerPoint here. Uh, and again, I'm Sarah Wasper Johnson, if anybody came late and missed the introduction. Uh, so I thought we would start the talk with one of my favorite cartoons of all time <laughs> uh, by Art by Moga. Um, and it's a tea drinker saying, coffee is disgusting. I only drink the finest leaves. And then the coffee drinker is saying, tea is just pompous water. Real adults drink coffee. And then it's the sweet little cocoa drinker saying, sometimes I add rainbow sprinkles. <laughs> Which tells you a little bit about the place that Coco has in uh, American pop culture, right? It's very synonymous with childhood and innocence and sweetness. Um, and I like this cartoon because it juxtaposes Coco against coffee and tea, which is another juxtaposition that we'll see later in the talk. All right, so I thought we would talk first about where chocolate comes from. So chocolate is indigenous to Central America, uh, first used by the Olmec civilization um, a long time ago, uh, 1500 to 500 BCE. Uh, and there's no written or um, pictorial evidence uh, from the Olmecs, but we have found archeological evidence of chocolate in pots and clay vessels. Um, chocolate was also used by the Maya uh, who were kind of like, came after the Olmec, um, they had, they drank chocolate, right? Um, it had a lot of religious uses. They added spices, they added cochineal, which is a, a red dye that you get from um, insects. The frothing aspect of cocoa, um, hot chocolate 
production was very important and they used cocoa beans as currency, which are all things that were adopted by the Aztec as well. Um, so Aztecs also used chocolate religiously and for them, the cochineal coloring um, meant that chocolate represented blood. Of course, sacrifice is a big part of Aztec uh, religion. And this image here, which is from the Mexican Tudela Codex from 1553 is of an Aztec woman frothing chocolate. And apparently um, the higher the froth you can raise on your chocolate beverage, uh, like the more high status you had as a woman. So I find that very interesting that, um, you know, there was these elaborate rituals around producing chocolate as a beverage. Um, chocolate production uh, was not that different than it is now, um, but less refined because everything was done by hand. So this is a matate and mano uh, used for grinding cacao during the Mayan period. You can see they have some nice cacao beans sitting there <laughs> to illustrate. So also, you know, a lot of other uh, food products like corn was ground by hand, chocolate was ground by hand. It's a very labor intensive process. So the Spanish invade Central America and Mexico. Um, Christopher Columbus actually first encounters chocolate on his fourth voyage uh, to the Caribbean and Central America. Um, a group of indigenous people come out and meet his boat in dugout canoes and he writes about they have large almonds that they use as currency and that they very highly value. And of course, um, if anybody knows anything about cocoa beans, you know, almonds are this big, even in the shell, cocoa beans are like this big, <laughs> but they are roughly almond shaped. So that's probably why he referred to them that way. So that's one of the first European uh, encounters with chocolate. Obviously, uh, Hernan Cortez uh, basically makes it his life's work to conquer the Aztecs. So this is him meeting Montezuma um, or Moctezuma. Uh, and who thought that he, Cortez was a god, which of course Cortez totally used to basically destroy the Aztec empire. But he wrote about um, drinking chocolate and how good it was and how rich and fortifying. So he talked about how like a drink, you know, one cup of chocolate, you could kind of go all day. Um, and he brings back chocolate to Spain but it doesn't really become popular until the 1540s when a group of Dominican friars bring indigenous people back to Spain with them and also chocolate and they introduce um, Crown Prince Philip who later becomes uh, King Philip II to chocolate and then he sort of introduces it to the royal court and that's where the European obsession kind of began. So 1585, um, Europeans start importing chocolate. And the chocolate, um, that they're talking about. I'll just talk briefly about this image. So this is an image from 1644, uh, very European version. It's Poseidon uh, taking chocolate from Mexico to Europe, right? So it's got Inda Chocolata is on this box of chocolate, right? So it's this kind of weird homage to Greek um, mythology, also with indigenous America, but it's in 17th century Spain. Anyway, um, some of the imagery around that is very interesting. So um, the botanical name for cocoa is Theobroma cocoa, which is like food of the gods, right? But it doesn't get that name until um, Carolus Linnaeus, uh, you know, basically catalog catalogs it botanically. Um, the indigenous name is under some debate. Some people think that the word chocolate comes from hocolatl. Other scholars say, no, it's more chicolatl. Some people say it's cacahuatl. Um, but regardless, the term chocolate is from an Aztec name. We just don't know precisely um, which one it is. <laughs> um, and then the Aztec language is also known as nahuatl. Uh, and then there's also hot chocolate versus hot cocoa, which we talked a little bit about in the cooking demonstration. Um, hot chocolate is melted chocolate mixed with milk or cream and sugar. 
and hot cocoa is made from cocoa powder, which we'll get to later. You can see also from the botan botanical drawing, it does marginally look like an almond, um, but it's much larger, right? So most people in Europe, uh, for pretty much all of the 17th, 18th, and most of, half of the 19th century, were not eating chocolate, they were drinking it, right? So we have this lovely illustration from 1744 of a woman um, drinking chocolate. It was usually drunk for breakfast, although sometimes also for afternoon tea. The spicing was, so nowadays we don't put anything, any spices in our chocolate except for maybe occasionally vanilla, right? But in Europe, they really adopted a lot of the spicing from indigenous people. So indigenous people put um, honey, they put vanilla, they put um, chili pepper, they put other botanical spices in it. So when it came to Europe, people are putting everything in it, <laughs> you know, almonds, pepper, ginger, if they could get, you know, the black pepper was kind of an alternate to um, the chili peppers that are also indigenous to Central America and were not widely available in Europe at the time. Uh, and then coffee and tea and chocolate all kind of were used simultaneously. Um, and it was kind of like a preference thing. Like if you were a wealthy upper class person and you were visiting someone, they might ask if you preferred coffee, tea or chocolate at breakfast and you could choose right? Um, because they're all had to be imported. They're all fairly expensive. They're all somewhat labor intensive. Tea probably the least labor intensive out of all of them. Um, and so talking about going back to our cartoon that I introduced, I thought this was a fantastic image. Um, this is from a book called De Nussage du Café, du Thé et du Chocolat, which is on the use of coffee, tea, and chocolate by Philippe Dufour. Um, it was published in 1685. And so here we have the three cultures that produce these three drinks. So we have an Arab man drinking coffee, we have a Chinese man drinking tea, and we have an Aztec man uh, drinking chocolate. And the three vessels uh, for distributing them are also here. So on the table is a teapot, on the ground is a coffee pot, and then on the floor, um, near the Aztec man is a chocolate pot. And a mo I think it's called a molinillo, I think is how you pronounce it, which is the frothing, the thing that you would froth the chocolate with. Um, it's almost like a whisk. So chocolate pots uh, were very specifically different than teapots or coffee pots, although they do somewhat re resemble coffee pots later in the period. So the one on the left is a copper chocolate pot with a wooden molinillo. Um, this is made in the United States. And this is very typical of a lot of the early chocolate pots in that the handle is on the side, right? So you're pouring from the side, but the spout looks very much like a coffee pot, right? And then the one on the right is a 19th century um, chinoiserie ceramic pot. And it has a much shorter spout up higher um, and I think that has to do with the thickness of the chocolate, right? You don't want to plug up a long skinny spout, um, but that's a style of chocolate pot that comes in later. And often people would have sets where you would have, especially if you had silver service, um, you would have a coffee pot, a chocolate pot and a teapot, all of the same service, right? So you could offer your guests multiple options. All right, let's talk a little bit about cocoa processing. So cocoa, cacao, we saw was the, and then those big beans, basically they have to be cut open and the seeds and the pulp are scooped out and they're left to ferment in the sun. And once they've fermented, the pulp is removed from the beans and the beans are dried, then they're roasted, then they're cracked into nibs and you can still buy cocoa nibs today. Like that's if you buy cocoa nibs, that's where it is in the process of cocoa processing. Then the nibs are ground into a paste. That's what the matate is for, right? For grinding into paste. Um, and then for hot chocolate, for chocolate, uh, cocoa butter and sugar are added um, to the ground paste. And then it's heated and conched 
um, for six to 78 hours. So like the longer it's conched, um, the higher quality it is. And that is part of the heating process. And then it has to be tempered, which means um, you're moving it as it cools so that it doesn't harden right away. Uh, and then for cocoa powder, as after it's ground into paste, um, most cocoa powder until the mid 19th century was broma processed, um, which means that you basically hang the paste in a warm room and all of the cocoa butter drips out of the beans, basically leaving 100% cacao. Later they invented hydraulic pressing. Um, and then if you grind it into powder at that point, uh, you have natural process cocoa powder. If you want Dutch process, you have to add an alkalizing agent, um, which makes the cocoa very dark, right? But also makes it less acidic. And then you grind it into a powder for cocoa powder. So that's how that works. So this is an image of the three stages of bean processing. So there's the fermenting pulp, there's the dried bean, and then there's the roasted bean. All right, so baker's chocolate, which is what I used to make the hot chocolate, as I had said in the video, it's a very old company. It starts in 1754 in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, in 1779, John Hannon, one of the founders, like disappears on a sailing trip. It's not clear if he died. It's not clear if he abandoned his wife. <laughs> Nobody really knows, but his wife sells uh, his share of the company to Dr. James Baker. Um, and their very first product that they make is a cake of chocolate for making drinking chocolate specifically, right? So they're buying um, the processed cocoa beans uh, and then processing them further into the chocolate, into cakes to sell for people to make drinking chocolate. I found this very interesting in my research in, so they end up in the 19th century, they expand out of Massachusetts and they end up in California with uh, the gold rush basically in the 1840s. And in the 1850s, uh, an employee named Samuel German pioneers German's sweet chocolate. So they continue to have just 100% cocoa, 100% cacao chocolate, which is not sweet at all. It doesn't have sugar added already. So Samuel German with German sweet chocolate adds sugar to the cake chocolate. Um, and somebody develops a chocolate cake recipe that they name after German's chocolate. So it becomes known as German's chocolate cake, which is how we get German chocolate cake. So if you've wondered <laughs> whether or not German chocolate cake is actually from Germany, the answer is no, it's not. It's named after Samuel German. Uh, in 1927, Baker's Chocolate is sold to the Postum Cereal Company, which later becomes General Foods. And in 1989, it's acquired by Kraft, which still owns it today. So, and interestingly, this image here on the right, um, also by Jean-Étienne Lyotard uh, from 1743-44, La Belle Chocolatier, the beautiful chocolatier, right? She's got her cup of hot chocolate. Um, Baker's Chocolate Company obtained the rights to use this image in 1862, and that's what their logo is based on, is this woman in 1740s outfit holding a tray. So this is the recipe I used uh, for the video, um, and then image of it from that 1936 um, recipe little cookbooklet. They also have a couple of other chocolate recipes there. There's reception, chocolate, um, which actually has flour in it. So you almost make like a roux, which makes it extra thick and creamy, I think. And then it says to make Spanish chocolate, you flavor with a dash of cinnamon. And then Brazilian chocolate has coffee in it. So instead of making um, your little syrup with milk or with water, you make it with coffee. And that's another alternate version that they have. All right, so in the progressive era, um, hot cocoa takes on kind of a new, you know, people have a renewed interest in it. So part of it is that during the progressive era, um, we're discovering 
nutrition and nutrition science, right? We're starting preliminary nutrition science research in the 1890s. And we discover um, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. That's the conventional nutritional wisdom at the time. We don't really care that much about vegetables except for fiber because vegetables don't really contain much um, protein. They contain some carbohydrates and not a lot of fat, right? So they're kind of useless because we haven't discovered vitamins yet and we won't until the 1920s. Um, so by the rubric of, of those three things being our main food elements, milk is considered the perfect food because it contains all three naturally. It contains carbohydrates or sugars, um, fat and protein altogether. So it's considered very suitable for children. It's considered very suitable for people who are ill, for elderly people. And so progressive reformers tried to get people to feed their kids more milk and feeding them hot cocoa is a way to get them to drink the milk. And also by heating the milk, um, you know, it's making it safer because at this time, most milk that was sold, even in cities was sold raw, raw milk, not pasteurized. Um, so it was kind of a sneaky way to get people to pasteurize their milk, right? It's also part of a lot of trends in trying to get immigrants to Americanize. So instead of feeding your kids coffee, which is a lot of something a lot of immigrants did, or tea, uh, they want you to feed them hot cocoa with milk because it has more nutritional value. Um, and a lot of that has to do with interest in childhood nutrition, right? There was all sorts of childhood diseases. There were childhood, later we discovered there were vitamin deficiencies, um, but getting kids milk um, and some of the calories, I think from the sugar was one of the reasons why they were pushing it so hard during the progressive era. And so I found this interesting um, advertisement from Baker's Cocoa. Uh, it says it's particularly adapted for elderly people as it contains considerable fatty matter, more than one quarter, yet it is easily digested and is pure and delicious. It is a real food containing all the nutritive prin principles, right? So here they're selling Baker's Cocoa as, you know, a health food, basically a fortifying food for elderly people. And there's two very sweet looking older people who in reality are probably only in their 60s or 70s, right? And then a very sweet kind of Gibson girl looking girl is serving them probably tea from the looks of it, but purportedly hot cocoa. So the main competitor for bakers is Hershey's, right? And this is actually my uh, picture of my cookbooklet that I cooked out of. Um, so Hershey's chocolate cocoa powder is actually their first product. Um, and then quite famously in 1907, they developed Hershey's Kisses, right? In 1926, they have Hershey's Syrup. So that was like an even easier way to make hot cocoa or chocolate milk, right? It becomes very popular because the syrup, you can mix it into cold milk and drink it cold. And then in 1937, they are hired by the federal government to develop an emergency ration that becomes known as D rations, um, which we will get to. And then the other primary competitor is Ovaltine. Um, which was invented in Switzerland and then moves to England. And then in 1915, the manufacturing moves to Illinois. Um, the ingredients are malt, milk, eggs, flavored with cocoa. So malt, if you've ever had like a chocolate malt or malted milk, malt is basically um, fermented barley <laughs> uh, that was used, that was considered like, um, a nutritional supplement. Um, so the mixture of malt, uh, powdered milk, basically powdered eggs, which they don't actually put eggs in it anymore by the time they did, and then cocoa, it was billed as a nutritional supplement for uh, children, the ill and the elderly, right? We're seeing a theme here. And that's totally what this 1917 um, advertisement is talking about. It's food for convalescents. Uh, malt, milk, eggs, and cocoa make an ideal combination. Ovaltine gives them to you in concentrated, soluble, granular form, quickly assimilated and easily digested, right? Victorians and progressives were obsessed with digestion. Um, yeah, Ovaltine is considered a complete food beverage. That's almost like a meal replacer, right? But 
In the 1930s through the 1950s, Ovaltine sponsored a ton of children's radio and television shows. So Ovaltine, particularly chocolate Ovaltine, because they did also have a non-chocolate flavor, um, became really associated with kids uh, and like a kid's beverage, especially a kid's breakfast beverage. All right, we talked a little bit about deration, but we're actually gonna go back to the First World War. Um, and there's this great image from 1918. This is a Y man who was somebody who worked in a YMCA canteen serving hot chocolate in the Toulon sector in 1918. And it says, said one soldier, the cocoa made them feel like new men. So in the trenches, not only was it wet and muddy and miserable, it was also often very cold and hot food was hard to come by. Um, so hot cocoa and hot chocolate really became a fortifying treat for a lot of soldiers, um, particularly since, especially if you can get it made with milk, um, which probably they were using powdered milk, um, but it gave you a lot of calories, it gave you sugar, which gave you a little bit of an energy boost, right? So it kind of is the perfect wartime food because it's got sugar, fat, and caffeine kind of all in one, which, you know, coffee and tea have sugar and caffeine, but they don't have that, that fat. And also a lot of these guys probably, you know, 1918, if you're an 18 year old soldier, you probably grew up drinking hot cocoa as a kid in the 1890s, 1900s, right? So it was probably comforting for them for that reason as well. All right, in World War II, chocolate um, gets a little bit of a boost from the government. So as we said, in 1937, uh, Hershey's was hired by the federal government to create the D ration, which was an emergency ration. So it was actually designed to be less palatable than regular chocolate. So it had oatmeal in it. Um, and it was designed to be very shelf stable. And the reason why it was designed to be less palatable is that the federal government, the army didn't want soldiers eating it for fun. It was designed as an emergency ration. Um, you were only supposed to eat it in emergency situations. You had to have it on your person at all times. So it couldn't be like super fragile or melty. And later on Hershey's actually made a tropical version which was even less melty than the original version so that um, soldiers in very warm locales, right? Warm humid locales, you wouldn't end up with a pocket full of mush of melted chocolate. Um, but as I said, they were designed as emergency rations so they were not supposed to be yummy. Uh, in 1944, uh, the C rations, which is like your meal ration, they added a cocoa disc. So it's a little disc of chocolate to the rations. Um, which was a welcome change because basically our options for a beverage were instant coffee or crystallized lemon drink, which was, I think, an effort to have a vitamin C alternative, but uh, soldiers said it was disgusting. So a lot of people would eat it, but a lot of people would also, you know, melt it um, to make hot chocolate. And in 1954, which is the Korean War, sea rations were updated to include sugar and powdered creamer packets. So a lot of the soldiers would mix, like melt your cocoa disc in hot water and then add the sugar and the creamer to make something that actually approximates real hot chocolate. In the 1960s, uh, MCIs, which stands for Meal Common Individual, contained cocoa packets, like actual hot cocoa, and also tropical chocolate bars. And then from the 1970s on, MREs also have cocoa as a beverage option. So kind of interesting that hot chocolate has sort of infiltrated the American troops, right? And so here is um, another example from Nestle, which is a European country, or sorry, company of um, chocolate at war, during wartime. And this is what an emergency ration D looked like. So you're supposed to eat it slowly, but I find it interesting that it said can be dissolved by crumbling into a cup of boiling water if desired as a beverage. So if you don't wanna eat it, you can drink it, right? You see it's got the oat flour in there and skim milk powder. Again, you're bulking it up with some protein with the skim milk powder. Um, and one bar is 600 calories, right? So that would get you through part of the day if you had to with your emergency ration. All right, Nestle, uh, another competitor, originally starts um, 
as a condensed milk company in the 1860s. Uh, but in 1904, they start selling chocolate, solid chocolate. They're a little bit opposite to some of our other companies. They start with solid chocolate. 1936, Ruth Wakefield very famously invents chocolate chip cookies with Nestle chocolate. Um, she mixes chopped up chocolate into cookies, expecting to get chocolate cookies, and instead she gets cookies with bits of chocolate in them, right? 1936 is also when Nestle invents white chocolate, which somebody challenged me the last time I did this. So Nestle says they invent white chocolate in 1936. I have actually found earlier references to white chocolate going back to the mid 19th century, but it's not white chocolate as we think of it today. And Nestle is definitely the first to sell white chocolate commercially. Um, so I'm gonna let the, that they invent it stand. Um, and then in 1948, they launched Nesquik, which is a cold chocolate mix, right? So it's a powdered cocoa mix that you can make with cold milk instead of hot milk. Um, although you can also serve it hot, uh, most people drink it cold, right? So that's one of our hot chocolate competitors. And then the one that maybe you grew up with, I know I did, uh, Swiss Miss has a very interesting backstory. So in the 1950s, a company called Santa Dairy Engineers um, manufactured powdered coffee creamer, and they had a contract with the US government for a wartime production. Remember, we added powdered creamer, if we go backwards, there we go, in 1954, right? Our C rations are updated to include powdered creamer packets. So that is the Santa Dairy Engineers but because they wanted to ensure that they could make their contract, they overproduced. So when the Korean War is over, they're left with all this extra um, powdered creamer. So Charles Santa, who is the son of the guy who founded um, Sanitary Engineers, has an epiphany and he says, let's use our powdered coffee creamer to make hot cocoa. So they call it Brown Swiss, his brother comes up with that name. And first they market it just to airlines right, as an alternative to coffee on airlines. And what they found was that people were like hoarding <laughs> the cocoa packets. Like they wouldn't drink it on the airline, they would take it home. So they decided, all right, well, we should probably market this to the general public. So in 1961, they have Swiss Miss, right, of course, connecting to Swiss chocolate. So all of their packaging had like a lot of Swiss folk art Swiss and this, you know, this cute little girl with braids and a little Swiss outfit, right? Um, so it was fairly popular for, starting in the 1960s, but in 1989, it got really popular because Will Steger um, went on an Antarctic expedition and brought 2,000 servings of, of Swiss Miss instant hot cocoa mix with them. Um, and they did that because, again, like in wartime, hot cocoa is fairly caloric and it's easy to make. And in particular Swiss Miss, because it has the powdered coffee creamer in it, you, it's just, you add a hot water. Um, and they brought 2000 servings because they were drinking several servings a day uh, to try and keep their caloric intake up because you burn so many calories trying to stay warm in the Antarctic, right? So that became super popular. And sadly, Charles Dana only passed away in 2019. So, um, I found a great obituary for him that talked a lot about this history. So pretty cool backstory for them. I did want to talk a little bit about marshmallows uh, because you see marshmallows a lot in cocoa and also um, Swiss Miss does later develop a version with tiny dehydrated marshmallows in it, right? So marshmallows um, are originally from the marshmallow plant. Uh, it's a type of plant that grows in marshy areas. And the root is, has been historically used dating back to ancient Egyptian times um, because it's, it's got um, kind of like slippery throat coating properties. So it was used in medicine a lot. Um, but also you can, if you dry it and pound it into a powder and then whip it with water, it creates like kind of this fluffy thing that we know of as marshmallows. So in the 20th century, the very early 20th century, um, they figure out a way to manufacture marshmallows artificially from gelatin. 
so you don't actually have to use the mallow plant anymore. And marshmallow use kind of explodes. And the 1910s, people start adding it to hot chocolate in part because a lot of the rhetoric around marshmallows was using it as a cream replacer, right? So you're using marshmallow fluff in your frosting or instead of whipped cream, or you're putting marshmallows on top of cakes instead of cream, you know, or on top of all kinds of desserts and a lot of other crazy things, but dessert was the primary one. So people start adding it to hot chocolate instead of cream or whipped cream. And then, like I said, Swiss Miss adds the little teeny dehydrated marshmallows to their cocoa packets as well. All right, so hot chocolate today. Why did we stop making hot chocolate? Uh, I think watching me make it, you probably understood why we stopped making hot chocolate. It's pretty labor intensive. Um, although with microwaves, it would probably be a little bit easier. Melting hot chocolate in the microwave can be a dangerous process because uh, it can burn pretty easily, but it is much faster than cooking it over a double boiler, right? Um, so it's very labor intensive. That's why people mostly stop making hot chocolate. Hot cocoa, because we have all these instant hot cocos, I think persist because they are so simple and easy. A lot of the hot cocoa brands on the market water, um, which I actually don't recommend. It's much better if you add hot milk, <laughs> but hot water is harder to screw up, right? You can boil hot water and if you boil milk, it doesn't always turn out so hot. Um, a lot of people associate hot chocolate with comfort food with childhood. Um, you know, it's that progressive era idea that hot chocolate is for kids kind of persists, even though throughout history, hot chocolate was largely the purview of wealthy adults. Um, the turn of the 20th century is when it really starts to get associated with childhood. Uh, and then how do you drink it? I like my hot cocoa usually with whole milk, and sometimes I'll put in some kind of flavoring. Salted caramel is probably my favorite. Uh, and then who can say no to whipped cream on top, right? So that is the end of my presentation. So you guys can tell me in the chat how you drink your hot cocoa. And if anybody has any questions, I'm gonna go see if I missed any in the chat, which it looks like I did. Yes, Susan says, interesting that coffee, tea, and cocoa were all used for religious purposes. Yep, for sure. Not so much in Europe, though. <laughs> Once it got to Europe, it was mostly just fashionable, not religious. Um, Juliana says, hot chocolate and coffee, a Dunkachino. Is that like a Dunkin' Donuts reference? I don't drink coffee, so I don't know. Um, Elizabeth says, yes, mocha is coffee and hot chocolate. Um, Karen asks, what about Mexican hot cocoa? Yes, so they do. I can't believe I forgot about them. Yes, there is a, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the company now, but there is a um, company. It's like in the little yellow octagon box that make discs of cocoa um, that you can melt and it's spiced, right? Like that's what makes it Mexican. Um, okay, what else am I missing? Okay, yes, hot chocolate con churros. Yes, that's very Mexican is to dip churros in your hot chocolate, yum. Uh, okay, Elizabeth asked, were Hershey bars included in World War I American soldiers rations too? I think they were, but I couldn't find a specific reference. There's not as much, you know, World War I American history is not as good as the British version, sadly. <laughs> oh yes, Krista says the phrase, be sure to drink your Ovaltine. And then Neil, okay, yes, Neil, Oval Maltine is actually the original name of the Swiss company. Um, but then when it migrated to London, uh, they, they changed it to Ovaltine. Yep, so Oval Maltine, he says it's available only in Europe, but not to be found in the US. And that's why, <laughs> because they changed the name. So Anna Cecilia asked, what is the difference in the tropical variation of the ration? I was not able to find um, much on the ingredient differences. I'm guessing it had less fat um, so that it melted less easily. 
All right, Crystal likes her chocolate with a dash of vanilla and salt. Ooh, yes, I love salt and sweet things. Yamir says, I like hot cocoa with almond milk. How very uh, medieval of you. <laughs> Even though we didn't have cocoa in medieval Europe, people did put almonds and almond milk um, in cocoa in very early Europe. Um, Tammy says, mint. Yes, I love mint and hot cocoa too. Kim says, lots of whipped cream on top. Dinah says, I like cinnamon and marshmallows. Yum. <gasps> William, thank you for your comments. Jamie too. Maureen says, salted caramel. Thank you, Michelle. It's abuelita, abuelita cocoa or hot chocolate because it is actually chocolate. It's a disc of chocolate. Yep. Anna Cecilia too. Yep. Man, everybody else knows what this is except for me. <laughs> Um, okay, James, if you made your hot chocolate with, with Dutch processed cocoa, it's hot cocoa, not hot chocolate. Oh, no, but you put dark chocolate in it. Oh, maybe it's both then. Hot cocoa and chocolate. Interesting. Okay, any other questions or comments? Thanks, everybody, so much for cocoaing along. <laughs> if you do want to actually talk, you can unmute yourself and turn on your video if you like. Um, I just made a giant mess in my kitchen and made a giant thing of hot chocolate with my hot chocolate bomb that I bought. Yeah, so that's a fairly new phenomenon is the hot chocolate bomb, which is a hollow circle of chocolate that people put cocoa powder, you know, like the hot chocolate mix in. Uh, my husband actually got some for Christmas from one of our friends because he's a hot, he doesn't like coffee or tea. God, he is definitely the hot cocoa drinker with the sprinkles, right? <laughs> oh, Elizabeth says, I love the hot chocolate Spanish style with a drop of vanilla, some cinnamon, and a tiny pinch of chili powder. That sounds so good, you guys. Yeah, I don't know. I have to like poke around and do some more research about chocolate bombs, hot chocolate bombs, because um, I don't know when or why they started. It seems to me like all of a sudden everybody is having hot chocolate bombs or hot cocoa bombs. Technically, I don't know, it's hard to say if it's hot cocoa and hot chocolate, what do you call, excuse me, what do you call it? Is it hot chocolate or hot cocoa? It's kind of, I think it's time consuming to make. So that's why I'd rather buy it to try to make it myself. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was recommended to use hot milk not hot water yeah so it depends probably on what is in the hot cocoa mix that's inside but even with regular hot cocoa mix i always use milk it's so much better elizabeth now telling us about devil's food chocolate cake with cinnamon and chili powder and a brown sugar frosting why do you have to torture us like this elizabeth <laughs> i've been trying to be good and now everybody's talking about cake and stuff makes I'm such a like a lot of, if, if you're like are you a cake or pie person I'm totally a cake person it's so bad I like pie too but anyway anybody else have any comments or questions well where can uh, if people do end up having comments or questions later on where can people reach you Sarah yeah, so um, you can visit my website, thefoodhistorian.com. I actually have a blog post um, from a couple weeks ago that talks about the difference between hot chocolate and hot cocoa, and I have both of the recipes from today's cooking demo up on there. Um, you can also follow me on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, at Preserver Parish. Um, I'll actually type this all in the chat so that everybody can just get the links. And uh, I think Tammy already tagged me in a post on Instagram, which I posted in my stories, which is super cute. I love that, Tammy. So thank you for doing that. Mostly because I don't really know how to do stories on Instagram. So it was fun to be able to do one. <laughs> yes, Anna Cecilia, all of the illustrations I used um, for the most part are actually from Wikimedia Commons. So if you want to explore the Twila Codex, um, there's a lot more il illustrations on there. Uh, it's pretty cool. And I think the descriptions might be in Spanish. I think somebody from Spain uploaded it. Um, but yeah, lots of cool stuff out there. 
Well, thanks so much uh, for coming out tonight, Sarah. Um, this is the last presentation we have with you, but I don't think it'll be the last presentation. I think we'll have to have you come back sometime soon <laughs> in the near future. Um, it's yeah, super fun. You know, this is my first yeah. time doing cooking demos. And uh, I think they turned out pretty good. So I might have the cooking demo bug if you want to do more cooking related talks. Yes, we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll, we'll do some collabs here. But, um, and again, this is all gonna be recorded and all of Sarah's presentations from the last several months. I think we started this back in October, November. So they will all be yeah, available yep. on our YouTube channel. And I think I'll just, I'll link all of them in the email to out to all of you guys. So you should all be able to watch Sarah and catch up on all of her food programs, which have been very fun for the library. Try more recipes. Yeah. Everybody can try the pumpkin pie recipe. That's a really good one. Or mac and cheese. That's mac and cheese I think is appropriate for Valentine's Day. So mac and cheese and a big mug full of uh, hot cocoa. I'm sure will go very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night, everybody, and hope to see you at more of our virtual programs. Um, feel free to check our calendar of events at the website, poklib.org. That's the library homepage. You can link to our events and sign up. Most of them are still going to be online uh, for the foreseeable future. So please check us out. We got lots of cool stuff coming up. And have a good night. Thanks, Krista. Bye. Bye.